Hey everybody, it's Andrea. Welcome back to the channel. Today I have a huge pile of books that I bought in November. In fact, it's not even a pile, it's a bag. <laughs> now, uh, what I will say is I will um, say that they were all only 25p from the charity shop. So there's nothing brand new, there's nothing exciting, like no new releases. It literally is just um, stuff from the charity shop. So in no particular order. First one I'm going to show you is I got Michael Connolly, The Black Echo. This is the first Hieronymus Bosch story. I used to read these loads, but I never read this first one. So, <clears throat> one Sunday LAPD homicide detective, Hieronymus Harry Bosch, gets a call out on his pager. A body has been found in a drainage tunnel of Mulholland Drive in Hollywood. The body looks like another OD, but Bosch isn't convinced. One new puncture wound amidst the scars of old tracks strikes an odd note, and something else. Harry knows him. Billy Meadows was a fellow tunnel rat out in Vietnam. Running against the VC and against the fear they used to call the Black Echo. Harry let Meadows down once and he won't do it again. So there we go. I really do like Michael Connolly. And completely different. I'm currently reading this. This is Enid Blyton's Christmas Stories. 25 stories about Christmas. Zena Blyton, couldn't say no. It's staying in the collection. So celebrate Christmas, the world's best loved storyteller. In this collection there is mystery, magic, laughter and mischief. The joys of shared times and plenty of delicious food. Many of the ingredients which have been delighting Edith Blyton's readings for more than 70 years. Which is bizarre because the new famous five, the kids don't actually drink ginger beer. So you can get two types of ginger beer in the UK. You can get alcoholic ginger beer and you can get non-alcoholic ginger beer. There you go. So yes. Reading that one as we speak. Uh, Jill Mansell, Three Amazing Things About You. I really like sort of all sorts of different types of books, don't I? It's not just uh, thrillers, I like romance and everything. Um, Hallie has a secret. She's in love. He's perfect for her in every way, but he's seriously out of bounds. And Hallie doesn't have long to live. Time is running out. Ooh. Flo has a dilemma. She likes Xander, but his scary sister really doesn't approve. Tasha has a problem. Her new boyfriend is the adventurous type, and she's afraid one of his adventures will go wrong. As Three Amazing Things begins, Hallie's about to be given new lungs, but whose? Ooh. That sounds interesting. Um, Lee Child, Blue Moon. So this is a Jack Reacher novel. I do like a bit of Jack Reacher. Uh, it's a random universe, but once in a blue moon, things turn out just right. In a nameless city, two rival criminal gangs are competing for control, but they hadn't counted on Jack Reacher arriving on their patch. Reacher is trained to notice things. He's on a greyhound bus watching an elderly man sleeping in his seat with a fat envelope of cash hanging out of his pocket. Another passenger is watching too, hoping to get rich quick. As the mugger makes his move, Reacher steps in this surprise. The old man is grateful, yet he turns down Reacher's offer to help him home. He's vulnerable, scared and clearly in big, big trouble. What hold could the gangs have on the old guy and will Reacher be in time to stop bad things happening? The odds are better with Reacher involved. That's for damn sure. I've always liked these ones ever since I started reading them. Uh, another Michael Connolly is Lost Light. <clears throat> Harry Bosch has finally quit the LAPD. When he left, he took a file with him, the case of a young woman murdered four years earlier. The crime was linked to a $2 million robbery on a movie set, and the LAPD think the money was used by terrorists. Now, with time on his hands, Harry looks at the old file again. Something about the victim affected him deeply, and the case has haunted him ever since. But when he decides to reinvestigate, he fouls of both his old colleagues and the FBI, and then someone from Bosch's past turns his world upside down. He's always upsetting somebody. But I love these stories. I don't like these tiny paperbacks though. But I am looking forward to reading this one. And um, then I got this one. This one, it, this is actually, this was actually, the, I think, the only new book I did buy last month. But I, it was only 2 99 so it's the only one that cost more than 25p, I believe. What's that one? Yeah. Um, and that's because I got it in Liddles. Because every now and again they have books in there. And I do try and pick them all up when I get them. So basically this is some scary stories, or creepy stories, ghostly tales for long winter nights, with stories by Bridget Collins, author of The Binding, Imogen Hermes Goa, author of The Mermaid and Mrs Hancock, 
Hirin Millwood Hargreave, Order of the Mercies, Andrew Michael Hurley, Order of the Lo Loney, Jess Kidd, author of himself, Elizabeth McNeil, Order of the Doll Factory, Natasha Pulley, Order of Watchmaker of Filigree Street, and Laura Purcell, author of The Silent Companions. Now, I really want to read The Silent Companions, and I bought this because Laura Purcell was in it, and I thought if I enjoyed the one in this book, I'm bound to love the short, you know, the short story, I'm bound to love The Silent Companions. I think I will anyway, so it's definitely on my radar to pick up at some point. Either new Christmas is coming, might get some Christmas money, or um, uh, second hand. Now, I was in the bookshop, oh, well, bookshop, I say bookshop, I call it bookshop because I don't ever buy books in there, in the charity shop, and they had two copies of this, and my friend Hayley bought the other one because we tend to talk about books. We, we When we do talk, we talk about books. She, uh, Her son goes to the same school as Jan, they're in the same year and everything, so we both picked up a copy of this each. Grace, Nadia and Mr Williams see each other at work every day, but it will take a crisis for them to finally reveal the truth about themselves. Grace is 40 and in love with David. Her life is about to fall apart in the most shocking of ways. Nadia is 17 and furious. She knows that love will only let her down. If she's going to succeed, it will be on her own terms. Maurice Williams is 86. He has discovered a lot about love in his long life and even more about people, and yet he keeps secrets. Sometimes you have to hit the bottom in order to find a way back. Ain't that the truth? And sometimes you need a friend or two by your side when you triumph. Uh, the next one is The Spitfire Girls by Henry, Henny, Jenny Holmes. Now this is a sort of book my mum likes. I'll read them anyway, so I'll pick this up to give to her. So I'll probably read this beginning of New Year. Anything to Anywhere. And of course it's about the uh, ATA, which is always an interesting thing to, to read about. That's the motto of the Air Transport Auxiliary, Auxiliary, the brave team of female pilots who fly fighter planes between bases at the height of the Second World War without radar or instruments. I am not kidding you. These women did not have any radar. They were not supposed to use anything that could get them spotted by the enemy. They, they didn't use it, they were literally flying blind. They were so amazing, these women. I believe one of my relatives was one. So it's said. Mary is a driver for the ATA, and although she yearns to fly Spitfire, she fears her humble background will hold her back. After all, glamorous Angela is set to be the next Atta girl on recruitment posters. Bobby learned to fly in her father's private plane, and Jean was taught the Queen's English at grammar school. Anybody could teach themselves that, it's not difficult. Before joining the squad, dedicated and resilient three girls rule the skies, weathering storms and dodging enemy fire. Mary can only dream of joining them until she gets the push she needs to overcome her self-doubt. Thrown together, the girls form a tight bond as they face the perils of their job, but they soon find that affairs of the heart can just be as dangerous as attacks from the skies. Will the fear and uncertainty ahead? Can their friendship see them through the tests of war? These are usually really nice, cosy, comfy stories. Uh, this is a kind of a wintry one, so I'll probably read that. This one in December, I'm going to keep it out. And it's called Snowflakes on Silver Cove by Holly Martin. I need to drink. I'm so thirsty. I've also done something to my finger here. I'm not, you know, because it hurts. I've, I've bruised the bone here somehow, and I don't know how. It was fine yesterday, and this morning I woke up and it was hurting, so maybe I lay on it funny. I don't know. Libby Joseph is famous for her romantic Christmas stories, yeah. Every December, readers devour her books of falling in love against the magical backdrop of the Christmas season. If only Libby believed in the magic herself. Struggling to finish her current novel, Libby turns to her best friend and neighbour, George Donaldson, to cheer her up. But George also needs a bit of support himself. Nervous about getting back into the dating saddle after splitting from his wife, he and Libby strike a deal. She will teach George how to win over the ladies and Libby will in turn be inspired to inject her novel with a good dose of romance. Hmm, see where this is going. As Libby and George explore the beautiful White Cliffs Bay on a series of romantic Christmas themed dates, Libby finds herself having more fun than she's had in ages and discovers feelings that she never knew she had for George. But is it too late? Will George win someone else's heart or can Libby act like the heroine in one of her stories and reach for her own love under the mistletoe this Christmas? I will keep that one out. I will be reading that this month. Absolutely. I'm literally just pulling them out in no order because <laughs> that's what happens. I buy them, I chuck them in a bag and then I haul them. 
and occasionally I actually read one. I do occasionally read them. Uh, Jeffrey Deaver, love Jeffrey Deaver. The Vanished Man. And 25p in the, in, the, in the charity shop. I am not one for buying new books unless they're going to become part of the permanent collection or the 2 dollars in Liddles or they're three for six in the works. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. <clears throat> anyway, The Vanished Man. Lincoln Rhyme. Now I have read one of his those stories about Lincoln before. The world's greatest forensic criminologist. Really? His partner and lover, Amelia Sachs, and an unstoppable killer with one final horrific trick up his sleeve. A killer flees the scene of a homicide at a prestigious music school and locks himself in a classroom. Within minutes, the police have him surrounded. There's a shout from inside, followed by a gunshot. The police break down the door and the room is empty. Lincoln Rhyme and Amelia Sachs are brought in to help with the high-profile investigation of Master Illusionist, but the conjurer baits them with gruesome murders that become more diabolical with each fresh crime. Ooh. As the fatalities rise and the minutes tick down, Rhyme and Sachs must prove beyond smoke and mirrors to prevent a terrifying act of vengeance that become the greatest vanishing act of all. Now, doesn't that sound good? <clears throat> Which one next? Uh, lies, Lies, Lies by Adele Parks. Sometimes they come back to hurt you. Lies. They can make you. They can break you. Daisy and Simon's marriage is great, isn't it? After years together, the arrival of long for daughter Millie sealed everything in place. A happy little family of three. And so what if Simon drinks a bit too much sometimes? Daisy's used to it. She knows he's letting off steam. Until one night at a party, things spiral horribly out of control and that happy little family of three will never be the same again. Ooh. Oh, now this is what I am looking forward to. Louise Penny, Glass Houses. One cold November day, a mysterious figure appears on the village green in Three Pines, causing an ease, alarm and confusion amongst everyone who sees it. Chief Superintendent Armand Gamache knows something is seriously wrong, but all he can do is watch and wait. Hope in his worst fields is not realised, but when the figure disappears and a dead body is discovered, it falls to Gamache to investigate. In the early days of the murder inquiry, and months later, as the trial for the accused begins, Gamache must face the consequences of his decisions and his actions, from which there is no going back. I have enough books to read one nearly every day for next year. So that's not going to happen. Oh, here's another one that my mum would like. Maureen Lee, The Seven Streets of Liverpool. A little, little old photograph of the kids on the front. I love, I love things that use historical photographs like that. Liverpool, 1942. As the residents of Pearl Street prepare for Christmas, another Christmas one. Might keep that one out. Adversity and tragedy bring them closer together. Eileen is worried about the growing distance between herself and her RAF husband since he was seriously injured. Why does he so often stay in London, not returning home to his loving wife and son? Lena Newton has longed for a baby of her own, but her husband is overseas for the Navy. Then a familiar face returns to Pearl Street. When Kitty discovered her American lover was already married, she was too ashamed to return home in disgrace with her baby. Finally facing her fears, Kitty, le Kitty learns that wife has more, one more surprise in stores, store for her. As the final years of the war are played out, Pearl Street sees friendship forged, hearts broken and the most joyful of reunions. I'm not crying. Oh, I just oh. I swear, some of these books do not look like they've even been read. This one is Before She Was Mine, and it's by Katie Long. Nothing can beat a mother's love except perhaps the love of two very different mothers. Freya is torn between her two mothers. Liv, her adopted mother who nurtured and raised her, it's earthy no-nonsense. The total opposite to Melody with her vibrant, explosive personality and extensive brightly coloured wardrobe. Freya's birth mother is still apt to find herself thrown out of Topshop for bad behaviour. Hard as it has been for Freya to reconcile her two families, it has been harder for her mothers and then tragedy strikes and the bonds of love that tie these three women together will be tested to the full. Can they finally let go of the past and pull together in order to withstand the toughest challenge life can throw at them? Yeah. Now the Michael Connolly one now. This is the Black Ice. 
Oh. The corpse in the hotel room appears to be that of a missing LAPD narcotics officer. Rumours abound that the cop had crossed over selling a new drug called Black Ice that had been infiltrated LA from Mexico and the LAPD brass are quick to declare his death a suicide. Detective Hieronymus Harry Bosch isn't so sure. Prompted by odd inexplicable details from the crime, seen an undeniable attraction to the cop's widow, Bosch starts his own maverick investigation that soon leads him over the border to Mexicali and into a dangerous labyrinth of shifting identities and deadly corruption. There you go. I think that's the second one before he, qu before he quits the LAPD. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Jackson, liar liar again. It does not look like this has been opened. Ah. I like Lisa Jackson. Remy's mother was always a liar. 20 years after her mysterious disappearance, did Dee Dee Storm makes headlines by jumping to her death from a San Francisco sky skyscraper. But could her lies have gotten it killed? It looks like a straightforward suicide, but Dee Dee's daughter, Remy, knows it isn't so simple. Because though the broken body on the pavement is dressed in Dee Dee's clothing and wig, it isn't her mother. And if Remy finds the truth, could she be next? Who is the woman who jumped to her death? Is this related to Dee Dee's disappearance? And is Remy the last of her family safe? Because it seems that someone is willing to kill to keep the truth buried by 20 years of lies. Ooh. That one sounds good. I picked up The Militarist by Jessie Burton. Again, doesn't look like it's been read. The spine is not broken. I just don't get. I mean, perhaps they're just very careful readers, I don't know. Uh, there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. Huh. On an autumn day in 1686, 18-year-old Nella Ortman arrived at a grand house in Amsterdam to begin her new life as the wife of wealthy merchant Johannes Brandt. Though curiously distant, he presents her with an extraordinary wedding gift, a cabinet-sized replica of their home. It is to be furnished by an elusive miniaturist whose tiny creations ring eerily true. As Nella uncovers the secrets of her new household, she realises the escalating dangers they face. The miniaturist seems to hold their fate in her hands, but does she plan to save or destroy them? Mm. I like the muse, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to like the miniaturist. This still tons, we better crack on. Uh, another Lee Child, one shot. Sadly, has got Tom Cruise on the front. Is it Tom Cruise? It's Tom Cruise. Right, six shots. Oh, this is because it's the one that was called Jack Reacher, which starred Tom Cruise, but it's actually originally called One Shot. I prefer the um, Prime Reacher series, which actually started with number one, Killing Floor. But there you go. Six shots, five dead. And of course, the guy that played Reacher in the series is much like, more like the Reacher in the books because he's actually over six foot tall, as opposed to Tom Cruise, who's like five foot nothing. But it's about my height. <laughs> Not that he can help it, can't help his eye, bless him. Um, I like him in other things. Minority Report, love that film. Six shots, five dead. A heartland, heartland city thrown into terror, but with hours the cops have it solved. A slam dunk case, apart from one thing. The accused gunman refuses to talk except for a single phrase. Get Jack Reacher for me. Yeah, I'd be asking for him too. Reacher lives off the grid. He's not looking for trouble, but sometimes trouble looks for him. What could connect the ex-military cop to this obvious psychopath? Is he a psychopath? Did he actually do it? I don't know. I haven't read it. So this is a thin one. Helen Cross, my summer of love. Nice thin one. Although I tend to find sometimes that really thin or smaller books can sometimes be harder to read than some of the long ones. The nature of the writing style and that's all there is to it. It's 1984, probably why I wanted to read it, and one of the hottest summer Yorkshire's seen. Mm, probably not sort of 76 though. It's a kind of woozy heat to lose your mind in. Mona is 15 years old, she's a drinker, a thief and a fruit machine addict. Things are already going badly in the pub where she lives with her obese stepmother pork chop. But when Mona meets posh Tamsin, Fakenham, a sassy girl with beautiful breasts, an actress mother and a sister who's died of starvation, things very quickly get much worse. Might be a quick one. I don't know. But yeah, this is something about that. It sort of like grabs you. Sarah Manning, you don't have to say you love me. 
and this is quite a thick one probably take me about three minutes to read well not three minutes but sweet bookish Neve Slater always plays by the rules so it's, it's in cursive and it was hard to read and the rule is that good nature fat girls like her don't get guys like gorgeous William heir to Neve's heart since university but William's been in LA, LA for three years and Neve's been slimming down and reinventing herself so that when he returns he'll fall in head over heels in love with a new improved her so she's not that interested in other men until her sister Celia points out that if Neve wants William to think she's an experienced love goddess and not fumbling awkward girl he left behind she'd better get some well experience what Neve needs is someone to show her the rope, someone like Celia's colleague Max, wicked, shallow, sexy Max. And since he's such a man slut and so not Neve's type, she so certainly won't fall for him because William's the man for her, right? Obviously not. <laughs> Another Lisa Jackson one, again, doesn't look like it's been read. Did I buy this in... I'm, th I'm, I'm doubting myself now, did I buy these in Niddles as well, maybe? It's p potentially possible. Yeah, this is new. I got this from Little. Hence why it's not been read. Miniaturist wasn't there. That was from the cherry shop, I think. Uh, the woods are dark. Expecting to die. Mm. Some places earn their bad reputation through tall tales. Grizzly Falls is different. Here killers aren't just stuff of legends. Someone is in the nighttime shadows watching the local teens in the moonlight woods. Waiting for the right moment and the right victim. Waiting to take away a life. And deep. Detective Regan Pascoli is counted the days until her maternity leave. Exhausted and emotional, the last thing she needs is a nurse suspected serial killer, especially when her daughter Bianca is swept up in the media storm. And deadly. Another body is found. And another. And as the nightmare strikes closer to home, Pascoli races to find the terror lingering in the darkness where there are too many places to hide and countless places to die. That's it then. I like it. Now my dad makes me laugh because he says, oh I don't want to read that book, it's by a woman, it's about women's things. And it's like, no, you know, dad, women can write thrillers and horror novels too. And men can write romance, you know? It's, you, you can't judge a book by its author. Well, not always, <laughs> sometimes you can. Now again, this one, he wouldn't, it, this it wouldn't be his interest, but my mum would like it. Annie Robertson, my Mamma Mia Summer. She had a dream and now she's going to live it. Laurel hasn't taken a risk her whole life. Now, as summer dawns, she's going to do something that nobody expects of her. Laurel turns to her beloved ABBA albums and her favourite film, Mamma Mia, for inspiration. She grabs her passport, dons her dungarees and jets off to Scopolis for her own Merrill-inspired adventure. I do apologise for pronouncing that so badly and correctly. Laurel arrives at the faded but charming villa Athena and soon befriends its eccentric owner. As she explores the island's famous sights, Laurel finds herself feeling strangely at home. So, should she return to her life in London, or could this be where she truly belongs? Ooh, what's this one? This one's interesting. Oh no, that's uh, actually one of mine anyway. I don't know why that's in there. Odd. Uh, the Whistling. This one again looks good. Rebecca Netley. This definitely was Charity Shop. Wasn't it? Do you know what? I haven't got a clue anymore. I buy so many books. I can honestly say, in December, I've only come from, I bought five and they're from the charity shop. When Elspeth arrives on a remote Scottish island to become nanny to a young child, she hopes to bond with her until she learns that the girl has not spoken for months. And Mary's silence is not the only mystery. Hypnotic lullabies drift, drift down empty corridors. Strange dolls appear in abandoned rooms and as the lights draw in, darker questions arrive. What happened to Mary's late twin, William? Why did their previous nanny disappear so suddenly? And is the whistling Elspeth hears at night just a storm outside? Or is something else out there? So it's a bit creepy by the sound of it. I like it. Uh, Karen Rose. Say you're sorry. Ow. A serial killer is on the loose in California, leaving letters carved into the torsos of his victims. When Daisy Dawson fights off a masked attacker one night, she grabs a necklace from around his neck. While well, she doesn't know then that she's found the missing link to a cold case that Special Agent Gideon Reynolds has been tracking for 17 years. With Daisy's help, he finally has the opportunity to get closer to the truth than ever before. But it soon becomes clear that Daisy's attack was just the beginning. Now the bloodied bodies of young women are showing up all over the state. As Gideon tries to track down the killer, it's clear he has a new target. And Daisy is in more danger than they could ever have realised. Like Karen Rose. Uh, Katrina 
Ward, not Catriona, it's Katrina. Little Eve. On New Year's Day in 1921, seven mutilated bodies are discovered richly arranged on a remote Scottish island. Dinah is the sole survivor. She knows that Eve killed them and then drowned while attempting to escape the island. That is what happened. That is the story she's always told. But Eve has a darker, stranger story to tell. A tale of a cult, of strange friendships, and of her faith and love being tested. And as the two women's tales interweave, the truth will be slowly, slowly become clear. So that sounds really interesting. So two perspectives by the look of it. Another Michael Connolly, City of Bones. These ones you can tell have been read, but not only once. Oh, this one. When the bones of a 12-year-old boy are found scattered in the Hollywood Hills, Harry Bosch is drawn into a case that recalls the darkest memories from his own haunted past. The bones have been buried for years, but Bosch unearths the child's identity and fractured life, determined he will not be forgotten. Then a love affair begins to blossom for Bosch until a disastrous mission leaves him in more trouble than ever before as he faces an unimaginable decision. The Creeper by A.M. Shine. Sounds like a few creepy ones this month. When a renowned, renowned academic seeks help with a project in a remote Irish village, historical researchers Ben and Chloe are thrilled to be chosen until they arrive. The village is isolated and forgotten. There is no record of its history, its stories. There is no friendliness from the locals. Only wary looks and whispers. The villagers lock down their homes at sundown. A nameless fear stalks the streets. Nobody will talk. Nobody except one little girl. Her story strikes dread into the hearts of the newcomers. Three times you see him. Each night he comes closer. That night, Ben and Chloe see a sinister fidget figure watching them. He is the creeper. He is the nameless fear in the night. Stories keep him alive and nothing will keep him away. Doesn't that sound good? I'm not one of those people who reads creepy books for October. I'll read them all year round. Two more to go. This one. David Nichols, start of 10. What does a woman really look for in a man? Advanced general knowledge, of course. 1985, first year student Kate Bush fan Brian falls for beautiful university challenge queen Alice Harbison in a brilliant comedy of love, class, growing up and the all important difference between knowledge and wisdom. Sounds good, that's it. And finally, Wilbur Smith, ghost fire. This is probably one of my dads. Inseparable, inseparable since birth and growing up in India, Theo and Connie Courtney are torn about by the tragic death of their parents. Theo, wrapped with guilt, seeks salvation in combat and conflict, conflict, joining the British in the war against the French and Indian army. Connie, believing herself abandoned by her brother and abused and brutalised by a series of crop guardians, makes her way to France where she is welcomed into high society. But even here she once again finds herself at the mercy of vicious men whose appetite for war and glory lead her to the front lines of the French battlefield in North America. As the siblings find their destinies converging once more, they realise the vengeance and redemption they both desperately seek could cost them their lives. So those are all the books I got in November. I'm mad, I know, I have more books coming in than going out. But these are my comfort books, these, these are my emotional support books and I'm not letting them go. I'm keeping them forever, no not forever, but I will read them and then I'll pass them on to my mum and dad and then I'll go back to the charity shop. Which book are you looking forward to me reading? Let me know and I might pick it up next. See you soon.